Good morning. I'm Dr. Kleindel. Today I'm with Dr. Hartshorn Tony. and Axel the dog. And we are going to be doing Axel. some wetland determinations. Essentially, we're going to do data plots inside and outside of a wetland and look at the differences between those two. Tony is a professor here at Montana State University, soils professor, and he's got a lot to say about these sort of things. We chose this particular site because this is a, an upland site. And we know that it's an upland site for a couple of reasons which we're gonna explain in a second. And then we're gonna go off into a wetland. It's a wonderful wetland for, for Bozeman. And the reason we think and care about wetlands is because wetlands do all sorts of things that uh, provide ecological function. Some subset of those functions are beneficial to humans. And so they provide ecosystem services. That's our, those are the things that maintain human well-being. Uh, there is not a, a, a Clean Uplands Act, which is too bad for that, but there are other laws that protect uplands. But wetlands are protected under the Clean Water Act. So a wetland is defined as a area that's inundated or saturated with water at a sufficient duration. Time. Right, that supports and under normal circumstances, so it's not been disrupted by things, supports a prevalence of vegetation typically adapted for life in hydric soil conditions. Mm -hmm. What's a hydric soil? What's a hydric soil? What's plants that are typically adapted for, for life in those things and, and then what's a sufficient amount of water? So That's, I hear you that where we draw lines has everything to do with our code of federal regulations. And state and local, yeah, right. But ecologically, it gets fuzzy. And ecologically, we go from wetlands, wetter lands, to less wetter lands, <laughs> and uplands. You know, that whole ecological gradient absolutely. is absolutely fascinating. But the regulatory gradient is different. Yeah. Where are we? Where are we? Where, like, give me, draw me a geomorphological picture because I bet your audience can only see that we're outstanding in our fields. We are outstanding in our fields, certainly. Well, you know what? We're coming down off of the Gallatin fan. The Bozeman fan. We're the on Bozeman the Bozeman fan. fan. A huge erosive feature at this angle that goes downslope from the Gallatin range that way to the Gallatin River that way and left all this alluvial deposits. Alluvial being rounded rock, all sorts of things. Water moves through that in these weird torturous paths are called. The uh, rounded rock goes down slope there's soils deposited on top, water's moving through it, and sometimes that water pops to the surface and then goes over surf, over land in wetlands and streams. And sometimes it runs deep below us so we don't get enough water to interact with the landscape to make it a, an apple. Perfect. So as we fly around, we can see those, some of those features. A lot of talking. Let's cut there. Wetlands are made up of three parameters the plants, the soils, and the water. So when we go out to collect data in these data plots, we've got to collect those three elements. What does the soils look like? What's the presence or absence of the water? And then what's the plant community look like? So how do I measure prevalence of vegetation? Uh, I do line intercepts, which is this line tape we have in front of us. And then what I do is I walk down that line and I say from 50 feet to 46 feet, we have this thistle. And I know that these thistles are an upland plant. And then I, I will fill out this data sheet so that I have in my pocket right here. And I'm gonna take the data on the plants that are along this line. And then I know that because I'm doing a 50 foot tape and I know that it's four feet of this thistle. And if that was the only four feet, I can calculate the percent cover. But there's a lot more thistle here. I chose this line because it's representative of the plant community in this area. Characterizing a soil is a super ancient practice, and you can imagine early farmers, you know, 5,000 years ago, were always trying to figure out, well, where am I gonna plant my crops this year? So, I mean, we sort of leverage a little bit of that when we're characterizing soils, even today, 2021. You know, the first thing that we always wanna do when we're trying to characterize the measurable soil properties is just open up an exposure that gets us some sense for what a two-dimensional sort of cutaway of the soil would look like. Um, there are a couple different features of this soil that pop out to me very clearly, and one of them is there's a huge color change between the surface of this soil and then the subsurface, and that's most clearly expressed 
down right here at about eight inches. Um, so darker above, lighter below, and that's perfectly intuitive. I mean, what we know is that anytime you have a green plant, which you've been characterizing for this site, um, it's actually associated with what are called roots. And those roots are constantly leaking organic matter or sugar, just like donuts, into the soil. And as a consequence, soil organic matter is a soil, it's a soil color bully. We can actually quantify that um, with something called a Munsell color book. All ranges of sort of the visible spectrum, you always want to be able to find uh, sort of your lifeline page, which is right there called the 10YR page. And I hope that what you can see is this profile sort of looks like this a little bit, right? Darker colors at the top, and that's because of the influence of the organic matter leaking out of roots. It's also a function of leaves decomposing near the surface, and then much brighter colors. So we would call that high chroma and high value values much, much lower. Along that whole face, do you see any indications of a fluctuating water level? I see zero indications of a fluctuating water table in this profile. And what I would look for are what are known as redoxymorphic features. So places where microbes have run out of oxygen and had to downshift metabolically and use what we call alternate electron acceptors because they wanna live just like you wanna live. And when you run out of oxygen, when the water table comes up, in wetland soils, microbes will use alternate electron acceptors. You and I are using what as an electron acceptor? Uh, oxygen. Oxygen, that's why we inhale oxygen. CPR is all about delivering oxygen into a human being, right? Microbes don't need to use oxygen always, especially wetland adapted microbes. They have a whole bunch of metabolic tricks for downshifting their metabolism when oxygen is not readily available. I see no indications of areas of bright red or orange iron colors. So oxidized iron looks like rusted iron, sort of oranger hues, high chroma we would call it. And when the iron is reduced because there are microbes who are not oxygen breathers, they are iron breathers. And when they breathe using ox iron, they will actually turn it into these gray colors. So iron changes color depending on whether it's reduced or oxidized. So these are good examples of what happens to the color of iron once it's reduced metabolically by microbes. It turns more of these blue gray colors. Sweet. As Tony told you, we didn't see any indications of water in the, in the soil pit, but we have to look for indications of water on the ground. So water isn't always present in wetlands. In fact, most wetlands are saturated just below the surface, so you can walk out and not see any water at all until you start digging holes. But then water is also seasonal and it comes and goes, and right now we're in a very dry year. So I would look for indicators of water, rack, uh, staining of leaves, uh, deposition of soils, uh, where it is on the landscape. The vegetation is a really good indication of whether or not there's gonna be water. So if we have an upland plant community, pretty good indications there's not gonna be a lot of water. I don't see any indications as I'm walking around here on the ground of water, but I do see sort of geomorphic or topographic indications as we go downslope behind me, and it also gets greener back there, and the plant community changes quite a bit. So if I was to look for a wetland, I'd be looking over there in that deeper green area. But here, we have an upland plant community, we have upland soils, I see no indications of water, so all three of those parameters are absent, and I would call this an upland location. But you know what? Let's go look at a wetland. Let's go climb into the bushes and find a wetland. So, all right, Tony, you dug this beautiful hole, and you got the water out of it enough to look in. I see the water's pouring in from the sides. Oh my gosh, it's very wet out here. Um, and also, look how clean I am, everybody. And look how dirty Tony is. That's the difference between our professions. I'm a talker. He likes to teach by PowerPoint. <laughs> I like to do hands-on. <laughs> That's so funny. Anyway, hop down there and tell me what you find. All right. What do you want to know? What hydric indicators do you see down there? So... That would make this a hydric soil. That's hard. But the first one has to be 
that these soils are saturated. An excellent example of that that I can demonstrate is here is a perfectly good clod of soil. This is four to 12 inches. And when I squeeze it, that water runs right down to my elbow. So these awkward, soils are saturated. Awkward moisture regime. Number two, I almost passed out bailing this hole because I could smell hydrogen sulfide, which is, of course, what we associate with rotten eggs or fart. Yeah. Your nose evolved to tell you when things are funkifying. I can smell a little bit of it, but I think my nose has completely saturated. So if I fall in head first, just pull me out. These microbes are provided with plenty of sugar right. and not enough oxygen. So they switch and they become sulfate breathers. Mm -hmm. And when you're a sulfate breather, you produce hydrogen sulfide, which is rotten egg odor. And would you call this the histosol? You know, histos is Greek for tissue. Tissue. So this is essentially rotting tissue. Yes. Plant tissue, root tissue, human tissue. How many oh, bodies at, are buried here? At least one. Well, I'm on my way. <laughs> And so that's a hard question because you have to meet certain depth criteria and certain carbon criteria to meet the definition of a histosol. Those are the rules. And you, can you tell that in the field? I can't tell it in the field because I don't know the organic carbon. We can't see organic carbon, but a good rule of thumb, I'm gonna vote that this is... God, Jesus Christ. I'm going to vote this is 70% organic matter, which means 35% organic carbon because uh, organic matter is double. As a rule of thumb, <clears throat> organic carbon. So yeah, I would go histosol here. Also, I got one more question. What does it taste like? Because I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to eat it. Maybe I'm missing out. Is it sugary? Is it is it septic-y? Is it like the septic stuff we've been talking about in other videos? The septic, it's just Septage, upstream of us? Yeah which is leaking shit my direction. Yes. Fecal cold I'm forms. sure we can beep that. Um, sure, yeah, go ahead. What does it taste like? Jeez. Um, yeah, soups. You know what? It tastes like um, fiber material, and it's not sweet. But the key is, when you put a little bit of this between your teeth, you can tell if it has sand grains in it. You can tell if it has silt grains in it, because your teeth can detect sand down to 10 microns. So, so And I've got no grit. Okay. No grit. So it's not really a taste thing, it's a, it's a texture thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's not like umami. Well, you got more grit than I do because I'm not putting it in my mouth. Why not? <laughs> if wetlands are doing their job, they should be cleaning up all those fecal coliforms. Which is an ecosystem service. Exactly. Boom. Thank you. Yeah. What? I trust the wetland to do its job. You don't. That's interesting. That's, well, you can, you can just stay in there all day. I mean, you look like you're in hog heaven, literally. I am in hog heaven. Okay. Let's go look at plants. What I did again, put, set a, a transect line. So I'm doing line intercept. When does the beginning of my line, did this cattail start? And where does it stop over there? I measured it, it starts with zero, right where I dropped my line and goes to 33 feet. This transect is 50 feet. So if I double that, then it'll be a hundred. So I could say that roughly the typha in this area is about 66% cover. And when I set up my plant survey, I want it to be typical. Remember when we were looking at our soil pit, we're underneath Beb's willows. And that Beb's willow starts at 26 feet and goes to 50 feet, which is about 50% willow cover in this area and about 60% cattail cover in this area. Plus a bunch of other things like currants and, and docks and, uh, and lots of other plants. And I went through and I measured this just like I did in the other site. I wrote it down on my data sheet. In the regulatory world, my job is determine whether it's a wetland or not. I take that determination to the Army Corps of Engineers and they confirm my determination by giving me a letter of confirmation. This is a wetland, that's an upland over there because they have the oversight under the Clean Water Act to protect these, these important areas. So remember, we're talking about three parameters, water, soil, and plants. Now we're, let's, let's talk a second about the water. Now, as you saw in the soil pit, when we dug it, there was water pouring into it from the soil face. And if we leave it sit for about 15 minutes, which we've done now, we can see water at the surface. And I'm gonna ask you a question, Tony. Where's the elevation of the groundwater in this area? Well, I would guess it's right here. Right there, exactly. Groundwater is always this thing like, where's the groundwater? What's groundwater? 
it's right there. That is the water in the ground. And, and, and groundwater can be super complicated. There can be multiple layers and whatnot. But as we see, if we look up this way, we see places where you don't see water. If we dig a hole, we see water right at the surface or maybe an inch below the surface. That's why I can stand here and you know jump up and down and I can see a little bit of water coming to the surface. But that water is right there and that water is as deep as that hole. So I'm saying, remember there's saturation and inundation at a frequency and duration. And that saturation has to be at or near the surface. And that's what we have right here. And as we look around, we have water expressing at the surface all over the place. That combined with the soils that we just talked about and the plants we just talked about, that I would consider this to be a wetland because it meets those three parameters very clearly. Agree with me? Well, right, the field test is always carry a sponge with you. And if you can do that with the surface of your hole, um, that looks like a wetland. Like, that looks like a wetland, exactly. All right, thank you.